Greetings everyone. I am your Hello Queen. Welcome back to my court. Welcome if you are new. In this episode we're going to be talking about episode 8 of Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time, which is currently on Amazon Prime. It is the last episode in season 1. I don't know if we have a date for season 2 coming out. I do think they've already filmed it. I know they've cast for it already. But this can be a full breakdown of season eight or episode eight, and then I'm gonna take on the whole season. So same rules apply. We will be talking to you as if you've seen all eight episodes of this season so far. If you have not yet watched episode eight, please go ahead and hit that watch later button and come on back after you have. I will be of attempting to avoid book spoilers where they will spoil where the season or the series is probably going but we will be talking about the books in relation to the action is going on the screen so we will be comparing and contrasting but I'm going to try not to spoil things that are probably going to happen in the series so grab yourself a drink come on back and we'll get started <laughs> Episode 8, we start out with the cold open, industry term for a scene at the very beginning that thematically resonates with the rest of the show, but isn't part of the plot of the rest of the show. So let everybody kind of trickle in and get seated and figure out what's going on. This particular one centers 3,000 years ago to the War of the Shadow, and we are seeing the dragon of that age lose their Telemann having a conversation with the Tamerlan seat. Note, there's a T in there. The one that we have in present day is the Amaralan seat. And her name is Latra Pose de Kumi. They're having an argument over what they should do with regards to sealing the dark one away. Luce Theron Telemann has a plan. He's gonna take as many channelers as he can take with him, and he's gonna go down to, he's going to go down to uh, the boar and seal him away once and for all. And he wants the women to help him because he thinks if he gets enough channelers, he can seal them away so permanently that this will never happen again. It will effectively break the wheel. We won't have to keep doing this every, every few ages. We can do this. We can make this happen. And Latra has absolutely no interest in this. It's like, you're exposing him to the one power. If he taints the one power, we are all dead. It'll destroy the world in a different way. And they're both clearly old friends. They have this sort of exasperation and this exhaustion with each other. They want to see eye to eye, but they just, they, and they want to convince their friend of the other side, but it's just, it's not happening. And they know there's no budging each other, no matter how much they want it. So they, they kind of resignedly take their leave of each other. Now, we do know that Luce Theron Telman takes his 99 companions, all male, down to the boar and seal it, the, and seal the Dark One away. But in his final stroke, after, he se after sealing the Dark One in his 13 Forsaken, he taints siding. We will never know if he had taken the women with him if they could have actually done what Luce Theron was thinking and that was seal him away forever or if Latra could have been right. But we see where this argument ends up leading and that's what happens. Luce Theron takes the 99 down, they seal the Dark One and the 13 Forsaken away, but Sidon ends up getting tainted and all the men go crazy. Not cool. Okay. So. That being said, that's the cold open. Then we get back into the actual meat with the characters that we know and care about. And I'm not going to do this chronologically, like keep flipping back and forth between characters because we have the people left at Faldara, we have the leaders of Faldara, and we have... Uh, random marine off on the road. So I'm going to start with Faldara.
and we're going to talk about what's happening with Faldara. Okay, so the immediate reaction to the fact that Rand and Moran have gone and left them is mixed. Egwene wants to follow Rand. Rand, as far as she's concerned, is the love of his love of her life. He, she thinks that she's thinking that she has to fix this. This is this is Egwene to a T. That she has to fix this. She's going to go after him. She's going to do everything. And Perrin talks her out of it. He's like, we can't follow him. We don't know how to handle ourselves in the blight. This is the blight. You're crazy. We can't do this. And the two of them kind of reconcile about the fight they they had little spat that was going on the last episode and she ends up letting him embrace her and, and comfort her because she's clearly upset. She doesn't want to see Rand go into the into the blight by herself. And then we see Lynn and Nynaeve have an exchange. Nynaeve can clearly see that Lan is upset. Asks if she he can feel anything through the bond. He says no, she's got it masked, she doesn't want to be followed. And Nynaeve reluctantly gives up that she never tried, she was never able to track Lan. The person she was tracking all along was Moraine. Moraine has some sort of tell that she was able to track her by. And this is a tell that Nynaeve can teach Lan. And, and kind of reacts funny. It's like, why, you want me to go after Moraine? It's like, I want you to go after Rand. You get him, you bring him back. And then the two of them have this this really cute exchange, and they have this exchange in they have this exchange in the book as well, where they kind of plight their troth to one another. They 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 kind of admit that they love each other in in their own way. Nynaeve is far too stubborn and far too puritanical, and Lan is trying to let her down easy. In the books, Lan is about twice her age. He's in his 40s. Uh, she's 26. So there's a fairly big age difference there. Lan is a warder to another Aes Sedai. Lan is, has been given a fight that he cannot put down against the Shadow. He's a diademed lord of Malkiri. His, his job, he feels, is to avenge his people and to be there for the last battle. So he doesn't feel that he really has a life to give to a significant other. So Nynaeve says, a wisdom never weds, but if I'm going to Tarvalon, it may be something, may be that I will be something other than a wisdom. It's her kind of coy way of saying, oh yeah, well, you know what? Maybe there is a future for us and Len compliments her but says I will hate the one you choose because he's not me but I will love him if he makes you smile she this is slightly different from the books because in the books there is no prohibition against a, a wisdom marrying the prohibition really is just the fact that wisdoms seldom marry because a wisdom of a village has a lot of clout and as is common even from our past and even some people in the present feel this way is men do not like being overshadowed by their wives and a wisdom would have more clout than almost any other man in, in a particular village so they're really aren't many people that a wisdom would be able to marry that she wouldn't overshadow and very few men would be willing to be overshadowed by their wife so it's not that wisdoms can't marry it's that they just generally don't because it's it's a difficult match to make and when in the book when Lance when she says a wisdom wisdom seldom wed she and, but if I go to Tarval and I'm, there's a chance there'll be something else, Lan kind of chuckles a bit and says, I said I sell, wed more seldom than wisdoms. And it's very true, because not only do I said I have more political clout than any man that they would possibly wed, 
but they also have access to the one power. So not only could a could a Aes Sedai wife dress down her husband and be right in doing so, and Aes Sedai could literally take him by his ankles and shake him, turn him upside down and shake him if she felt like it. it this is there's a very serious power imbalance there, and many men are not willing to deal with that. So, not only that, I said I, as a consequence of working the one power, also live quite a bit longer than most people. So, an I said I taking a husband when she's relatively, when she's a relatively young I said I, will watch her husband grow old and die of natural causes, even, while she still looks relatively young. So, all of these things combined mean I said I very rarely ever marry. So, that's the same pretty much there. And it's, it's, basically this is a doomed romance. She, he can't give up the, the vows that he has and, and she can't change what she is. They both love each other, but they don't think it's going to work. And it's cute, and it's and it's sad, and everything else. Then we have the girls, they're both trying to listen to the wind. And Nynaeve says she's not been able to listen to the wind since she channeled. Which is different from the books. She listens to wind all the time. She doesn't always understand what she's getting from the wind anymore, because her ability has uh, changed a bit. But she's still able to listen to wind in the books. In this scene, however, Egwene is able to listen to the wind, and she hears the same thing that she heard on Bell Time, only this time it's much, much worse. She compares Bell Time being a whisper to this being a scream, which makes sense because there weren't actually that many Trollocs who attacked the Two Rivers. The Two Rivers was an unguarded set of villages with no real fighting men. Here in Faldara, they're in the borderlands. Every man, woman, and child knows their way around a weapon or is learning their way around a weapon. In order for them to be adequately menaced in this place, they would ha it would have to be a much larger quantity of, of Trollocs. And the next scene, and we'll see that a little bit later on, uh, the next scene, they are headed down to see Ben again. Now that they know who she is. And they demand to find out what Min saw for Ren and Rain, and Min's like, no, that's that's not how this works. I don't give up what other people have seen. I will tell you that everything I see comes true. And that's straight out of the books. Min doesn't always know what she sees, but... For people who pay attention to what it is she sees and keep going in the books, they will find points that the weird object that she saw floating around somebody makes sense as a prediction later on. And sometimes she does know what she's seeing, and whenever she does know what she's seeing, it absolutely comes true. She's never had anything that she saw not come true. And here we see her vision of Nynaeve burning from the inside out. And then here we see her seeing images of these sh soldiers all dying. And before Min can verbalize any of this, or before they can do anything to continue the conversation, a horn blows. Presumably a horn of alarm. And we switch scenes. Now we're seeing, we're back in the main hall, Lord Agelmar, trailed by many of his warriors and his sister, are coming into the into there. They're finding out about all of these Trollocs that are uh, amassing in Tarwin's Gap that are going to attack the fortress in Tarwin's Gap. And it's bad. It, it's It's real bad. They're putting a brave face on it. They're going to go take the men, and they're going to go fortify Tar Tarwin's Gap and, and throw back the Trollocs, as, as, as they've done many times. Did I say orcs earlier? I meant Trollocs. Yeah. If I say orcs, ignore it. It's Trollocs. Orcs are D&D. &D. 
And here these two are talking about how this is bad, you can't hold the gap, and Odagomar tells her his fear. He fears this is the last battle. This is Tarman Gaiden, the, the prophesied last battle. Things are bad. Uh, there's no way they can hold the gap. But if there's a possibility to hold the gap, they need to do it. And if they can't hold the gap, they're going to leave the women of Faldara to try and hold Faldara. Basically, what they're trying to do is buy time. Every moment that they buy is a moment more for the messengers to get to the inlying cities and countries to let them know that Tarmagaiden is here. They need to protect themselves. If the world is to survive, they need to hold for as long as they possibly can. And that's pretty much the gist of this. All the men are going to go to Tarwin's Gap. All the women are going to hold Faldara. This does not look like it's going to go well. Uh, here we see the women setting up the siege engines. We've got ballistas, which are these big crossbows that are siege engines. And here we have Min. She is noping right out of this. I've seen where this is going. I know things are going to get bad. Bye! And I, uh, this is going to go slightly out of chronological order, but... What ends up happening is Lord Agomar takes all of his men, they go to Tarwin's Gap, they fortify them, uh, they've got forests of crossbows, but the Madral and the or Trollocs are just, there's just too many of them. They start climbing over one another and eventually they end up basically overrunning the fortress in Tarwin's Gap and Lord Agomar is killed as sort of a sign that they are going to take over this fortress, they are going to break through, they're done. And that is all I have in this folder. So, while the women are setting up, Lady Amelisa puts out the call for all women who can channel to join her. So we're going to follow Egwene and Nynaeve for a bit. Lady Amelisa, there's two other women. One of them has the Kisane on her forehead. That's this lady over here. I think she may be the same woman from the episode before. They are all out. They're out in the battlefield, outside. <laughs> there's nothing between them and probably the incoming horde of Trollocs and Fades that are going to come from Tarwin's Gap if it falls. So... They're out in the middle of nowhere. Hopefully they know what they're doing. Emilisa makes a remark about uh, Nynaeve and Egwene being Moraines too. And Nynaeve can't help but say, we are our own people, thank you. Uh, but basically these five women are their last hope as channelers. Then Emilisa asks to link. Now this link does not look like the one that we saw the a Sedai doing. It's similar, but it doesn't appear to be the same. And it seems violent. Amelisa is clearly pulling a lot of power through the four other women. And she's pulling it, and they're doing great things. They're blowing up lots of Trollocs. She's calling lightning. It's, it, it's all good this, on that front. But it's literally burning these women from the inside out. She's pulling so much that she's burning out the women in her circle. The other two women fall and burn, and then you start screaming at Amelisa to let them go, that, that she's killing them. But Amelisa is so drunk on this power that she doesn't hear Nynaeve. She doesn't care Nynaeve. She can feel every grain. She, she is absolutely drunk on this power. She's bur she herself is burning from the inside out. And Egwene collapses and Nynaeve comes over and grabs onto Egwene and starts reciting the words that she used when she was initiating her into womanhood. Talking about her braid and talking about how a woman is always alone and never alone. And 
we're to understand from this that she is somehow managing to absorb to shield Egwene somehow from what's happened what Emilisa is pulling from her. Emilisa burns herself out and Nynaeve falls dead. It's not entirely clear here that she's dead, but she definitely collapses. But when we see her, this is a little bit of time has passed at least. Nynaeve is clearly crispy and Egwene is trying to channel and bring her back and nothing's happening. And just as Egwene is about to give up, we can start to see these little wisps of channeling. And Egwene somehow raises Nynaeve from the dead. We don't know what, if any, consequences there are of this. Because we don't really see them after this. But yeah, they all, all the women die, except Egwene, who somehow manages to raise Nynaeve from the dead. Who knew that? We're going to get back to that later. While all that's happening, Perrin and Loyal are having a not great time. Uh, some of Lord Iglemar's men stayed behind, and they have removed the throne here from this dais or platform or whatever it's on and they're taking some pickaxes to the the stones and breaking them up we don't initially know to what purpose but that's what they're doing loyal and perrin are having a discussion perrin is clearly fighting with himself he wants to help but he doesn't want to do violence and he doesn't know he doesn't want to watch his friends die without him doing something but he feels completely useless and Loyal, being the voice of reason, says, If you don't know what to do but want to help, you just need to ask. So they do, and they help them dig. Okay. And what they end up digging up, I don't have a picture of it separately, but is this, this box here, which we find out is the box containing the Horn of Valer or Valir, or how you want, ever when you want to pronounce it. Now, the Horn of Valir is kind of a plot device. It doesn't get blown in this episode. It may not get blown for a while. But um, the Horn of Valir basically brings back all of your folklore heroes. So if we were talking about our folklore in our world, if someone were to blow the Horn of Valir in our world, people like... King Arthur, Queen Boudica, um, uh, Robin Hood, like all of the heroes from our mythology will be brought back. Maybe some of the Troys like he Trojans like Hector and, and that sort of thing. Um, some of them are historical, some of them are ahistorical. Uh, historical and myth kind of flexes and, and sort of wanes and waves into one another. But basically, all of the heroes from their legends and stories would come back and fight alongside them. So you can imagine that this is a big deal. This, this could be a game changer for any big fight that you're in. So obviously, the Horn of Valyria is a sought after object. We talked about that a little bit in the last episode. In the books, no one knew where it was. But it's a show. you got to change some things and speed things up. So it's been buried under the seat at Faldara, apparently. And people knew it was there. Okay. So Padden Fane ends up using the right password to get people to open the gate to let him and his his fades in. It's clear they are not the people that were expected, but the fades just killed the people who let them in anyway, so that's always fun. Perrin while they're op while they're trying to get the 
Unicorn out, sees Fane, and sort of goes and follows him. And tries to follow him, gets a little bit lost, hears screams, comes running back, and finds Pad and Fane killing Loyal. With the dagger that Matt had from Shatter Logoth, no less. So Loyal is dead a couple of ways over. Um, but since Perrin is not at this point capable of violence, he he just can't bring himself to do it. He and Pad and Fane have a what passes for a conversation, and Pad and Fane starts monologuing about it's like. Why do you think I went into the two rivers? Why do you think I dragged my butt up there to sell a few lanterns every year? It's because I knew you guys were Taviran, and by the laws of balance, some of you are going to come to my master's side. And while he's doing all of this monologuing, and he's sitting in Agalmar's chair with the Horn of Valera in his lap, uh, we cut to... A shot oh come on of these figures here which were on the entrance to Tarvalin we see Matt and we see it's this is a really dark shot but here is the White Tower. So he's back in Tarvalon. Or Tarvalon. That, that's going to be really annoying for me, is the new pronunciations. No, oh, no, we did all that. So as much as Perrin wants to kill him, Perrin can't bring himself to do that. And I think this is a good payoff of what they set up at the beginning with Perrin having killed his wife is it Perrin's Perrin in the books always had this dichotomy between creator and destructor so the idea that he's so loath to bring out weapons that he would let Pad and Fane and the Fades go despite all that it, it's a lot more justified than it would be compared to what his book motivation was, so I think that was probably why they did that. I, I'm still not 100% sure I like the fact that they basically fridged his wife, but this makes a little more cognitive sense than it would be if they left him with his book motivations. So, I'm kind of okay with that. Next up. So now we've done all the Fadara, now we get to the meat of this, which is Random Moraine. And it's pretty much the two of them talking about what's going to happen. They're in the Blight. The Blight is rot. It's effectively a rotting jungle, which is something we don't really get a great sense of here. We don't really get a great sense of the extreme danger of the Blight either. But it's basically a rotting jungle that's super hot, it's super, super humid, everything smells bad because everything's rotting, anything you touch has a chance to hurt you. Uh, there are creatures who would kill you as soon as look at you in this thing. They do run across a young man whose body is covered in molds and stuff and it's clear that he died horribly, but I don't think that really conveys what the blight is. The two of them talk back and forth. They they decide to rest, and we see Rand wake up from a dream. And Moraine starts to drill him on on what did you see? What was the dream? Dreams have power. And then all of a sudden, she dies horribly in front of him. Somebody sticks a blade through the back of her head that comes out her mouth, and she falls down. And this guy's behind her with the blade. And we've seen him from other other dreams, from other characters, and from Rand. So Rand shoots him with an arrow, and he lets the arrow go into his eye, 
and pushes it in and it sort of takes all of this leathery stuff off his face and now he looks like this. And he says he's the dark one and he he goes around and he gives he basically trash talks Rand. It's like, yeah, okay, I see that you are the Dragon Reborn. You don't look anything like the old guy, but I can see it in your eyes. What do you think you're doing here? Last time... What do you think you're doing here? Last time you came with 99 companions, all of them stronger than this one, and you think you're going to manage this this time with this one I said I? This doesn't make any sense. What are you doing? And Ran eventually stabs himself in the gut, committing seppuku, and wakes up from the dream, where just like when he thought he was waking up from the dream before, Moraine starts to grill him in the dream, and Rand's like, I don't believe a word he said, and continues on, and then he starts, instead of telling her about the dream, he starts grilling her on what her plan is. And her plan, apparently, is to give him a Sa'angriel, which is a very powerful magical artifact that will boost your ability to channel more of the power than you're used to. The way they describe it working in this is not the way it's generally described to be working in the books. In this, he'll start to channel it, and then he channels it through this, and this magnifies it. Whereas in the books, you would embrace the source through this item, and because you're embracing it through the item, you're able to, to draw in more than you normally would be able to. So, I don't know why they decided to change that. So, yeah, we're not sure why they decided to do that. At some point in here, they see Malkier, and I don't have a shot for this, but Rand makes some some crack about it. it looks like it's been part of the blight for a thousand years, and and Maureen's like, yeah, no, forty at most. And then she says something about how Malkier used to be miles and miles from the, from Tarwin's Gap, and now it's closer now. So apparently, the blight now has reality warping powers. <laughs> if she'd said that the blight border used to be miles and miles from Tarwin's Gap, or that the Blight Border used to be much further back away from Malkier than I got, would get that, but the way she's saying it makes it seem like these two map points are now somehow closer to each other. And I'm like, what? Anyway, they also at some point also see the army heading towards Tarwin's Gap, and they decide that the best way that they can do to, f to help these people to help people at Faldara who are going to be in line as these who are going to be in danger from these Trolluxes to continue with what they're doing. If they can seal the, the Dark One in, then they can deal with this. So they come to the Eye of the World, and this is not the Eye of the World. <laughs> this is a ocean nightmare of a shaft that is going down into the middle of the realm, but we'll, we'll go with it. it. It's okay, I guess. So, they're going down, they go down the stairs, and they get to the bottom. Oh, oh, I didn't get a shot of them at the bottom. So, they get down to the bottom of, of this shaft, and there is a circular bottom to it. And Rand starts seeing his former self, the last dragon, fighting the same person that he saw in his dream. He's not quite sure how, and he puts his hand on the ancient symbol of the Aes Sedai, the uh, yin-yang sort of symbol on the floor, and as soon as he touches it, he ends up in this delusion, where he's back in Emmons Field on a farm with Egwene and this little girl, who he finds out is his daughter. And everything seems cool. He's sort of mystified, not quite sure what happens. Like, did I hit my head? What's what's going on? I don't get this. And eventually he does try and test Egwene to see if this is his Egwene. To tell them, to repeat back what they didn't, uh, something they did in childhood. And she passes the test, and they kiss. 
Meanwhile, Moraine's trying to wake Rand, who's fallen asleep, and the Dark One confronts her, so she channels. Trying to stop him. He stops all of the knives that she was sending after him and turns around and stills her. Stilling, if you are not aware, is the female version of gentling. So she... He did what one group of Aes Sedai did to Loghain. She can no longer channel. And we'll come back to that. So she can no longer channel. And the Dark One's in this dream. All of a sudden he makes everything freeze. And he starts talking to Rand about how this is a paradise and he can keep it the way it is. And he shows him how the Dark One can change it. He asks, finally, how do I make this real? He says, because the Dark One's assistant, you can have this. this. This is what you want. You can have this. I can show you how to make it real. So he asks. And the Dark One effectively teaches Rand how to channel. Meanwhile, in the other world, Moraine has pulled a knife and put it to Rand's throat. And the Dark One is mocking her, going, he's channeling. And you don't know why he's channeling. He could be trying to free me. He could be trying to destroy me. You don't know why he's channeling. But the Dark One effectively teaches Rand how to channel. And Rand seems to be doing what he said he was going to do, and then he starts channeling into his hand where the Sangreal was. And he turns down the fantasy because the Egwene in here is not his Egwene. His Egwene would not want this for a future. His Egwene wanted to be a wisdom. His Egwene wanted to be a nice guy. His Egwene did not want to retire to a farm in the Two Rivers and have his babies, even though that's what he would want Egwene from Higwane. He loves the woman who has more ambition than that. And so he wakes up and he uses the Sangriel and he apparently destroys the Dark One, cracking the symbol under his feet. And after we cut away to go see other stuff that's going on, we come back and Rand has decided to strike out on his own. And Moraine can't stop him. He's like, what am I to tell the others? And she says, no, tell them, tell, tell them I died here. Tell them that I didn't make it back. And she's like, I can't lie. <laughs> it's like, you'll make it work. I know you will. R Lan eventually finds her. She confesses that at the eye of the world, she confesses that she can't channel anymore. She can't unmask the bond because there is no bond anymore. She's no longer Aes Sedai. He's no longer a warder. She can't channel anymore. And she tells him that he's gone and talks about they talk about the piece of the seal that she's holding on to which is Quendiar. It's a power wrought stone-like substance that nothing, not even the power, should be able to break and yet here we are with a piece of it broken. And then she echoes the line from Padden Fane that this was not the last battle. This is the first. This isn't the end. This is just the beginning. And roll credits. That's pretty much where we leave it. For episode 8, we start out with the cold open. Industry term for a scene at the very beginning that thematically resonates with the rest of the show, but isn't part of the plot of the rest of the show. So let everybody kind of trickle in and get seated and figure out what's going on. This particular one centers 3,000 years ago to the War of the Shadow. 
and we are seeing the dragon of that age lose their intelliman. Having a conversation with the Timurlan seat. Note there's a T in there. The one that we have in present day is the Amarillan seat. And her name is Latra Pose de Kumi. They're having an argument over what they should do with regards to sealing the Dark One away. Luce Theron Telemann has a plan. He's going to take as many channelers as he can take with him, and he's going to go down to... He's going to go down to... Uh, the boar and seal him away once and for all, and he wants the women to help him because he thinks if he gets enough channelers, he can seal them away so permanently that this will never happen again. It will effectively break the wheel. We won't have to keep doing this every every few ages. We can do this. We can make this happen. And Latra has absolutely no interest in this. It's like, you're exposing him to the one power. If he taints the one power, we are all dead. It'll destroy the world in a different way. And they're both clearly old friends. They have this sort of exasperation and this exhaustion with each other. They want to see eye to eye, but they just... The, and they want to convince their friend of the other side, but it's just, it's not happening. And they know there's no budging each other, no matter how much they want it. So they, they kind of resignedly take their leave of each other. Now, we do know that Luce Theron Tellman takes his 99 companions, all male, down to the boar and seal it, the, and seal the Dark One away. But in his final stroke, after, he se after sealing the Dark One in his 13 Forsaken, he taints Siding. We will never know if he had taken the women with him, if they could have actually done what Luce Theron was thinking, and that was seal him away forever, or if Latra could have been right. But we see where this argument ends up leading, and... That's what happens. Luce Theron takes the 99 down. They seal the Dark One and the 13 Forsaken away. But Sidon ends up getting tainted and all the men go crazy. Not cool. Okay. So. That being said, that's the cold open. Then we get back into the actual meet with the characters that we know and care about. And I'm not going to do this chronologically like, keep flipping back and forth between characters, because we have the people left at Faldara, we have the leaders of Faldara, and we have uh, Rand and Marine off on their own. So I'm going to start with Faldara. And we're going to talk about what's happening with Faldara. Okay. So the immediate reaction to the fact that Rand and Moran have gone and left them is mixed. Egwene wants to follow Rand. Rand, as far as she's concerned, is the love of his love of her life. He, she thinks that she's thinking that she has to fix this. This is this is Egwene to a T that she has to fix this. She's going to go after him. She's going to do everything, and Perrin talks her out of it. He's like, we can't follow him. We don't know how to handle ourselves in the blight. This is the blight. You're crazy. We can't do this. And the two of them kind of reconcile about the fight they they had. A little spat that was going on the last episode and she ends up letting him embrace her and, and comfort her because she's clearly upset. She doesn't want to see Rand go into the, into the blight by herself. And then we see Lynn and Nynaeve have an exchange. Nynaeve can clearly see that Lan is upset. Asks if she he can feel anything through the bond. He says no. She's got it masked. She doesn't want to be followed. And Nynaeve reluctantly gives up that she never tried. She was never able to track Lan. The person she was tracking all along was Moraine. Moraine has some sort of tell that she was able to track her by. And this is a tell that Nynaeve can teach Lan. And, and kind of reacts funny. It's like, why you want me to go after Moraine? It's like, I want you to go after Rand. You get him, you bring him back. 
And then the two of them have this this really cute exchange, and they have this exchange in they have this exchange in the book as well, where they kind of plight their troth to one another. They 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 kind of admit that they love each other in in their own way. Nynaeve is far too stubborn and far too puritanical, and Lan is trying to let her down easy. In the books, Lan is about twice her age. He's in his 40s. Uh, she's 26. So there's a fairly big age difference there. Lan is a warder to another Aes Sedai. Lan is, has been given a fight that he cannot put down against the Shadow. He's a diademed lord of Malkiri. His, his job, he feels, is to avenge his people and to be there for the last battle, so he doesn't feel that he really has a life to give to a significant other. So, Nynaeve says, a wisdom never weds, but if I'm going to Tarvalon, it may be something, may be that I will be something other than a wisdom. It's her kind of coy way of saying, oh yeah, well, you know what, maybe there is a future for us and Len compliments her but says I will hate the one you choose because he's not me but I will love him if he makes you smile she this is slightly different from the books because in the books there is no prohibition against a, a wisdom marrying the prohibition really is just the fact that wisdoms seldom marry because a wisdom of a village has a lot of clout and as is common even from our past and even some people in the present feel this way is men do not like being overshadowed by their wives and a wisdom would have more clout than almost any other man in, in a particular village so they're really aren't many people that a wisdom would be able to marry that she wouldn't overshadow and very few men would be willing to be overshadowed by their wife so it's not that wisdoms can't marry it's that they just generally don't because it's it's a difficult match to make and when in the book when Lance when she says a wisdom wisdom seldom wed she but if I go to Tarval and I'm, there's a chance it'll be something else, Lan kind of chuckles a bit and says, I said I sell, wed more seldom than wisdoms. And it's very true, because not only do I said I have more political clout than any man that they would possibly wed, but they also have access to the one power. So not only could a, could a I said I wife dressed down her husband and be right in doing so and I said I could literally take him by his ankles and shake him turn him upside down and shake him if she felt like it that this is there's a very serious power imbalance there and many men are not willing to deal with that so not only that I said I as a consequence of working the one power also live quite a bit longer than most people so an Aes Sedai taking a husband when she's relatively, when she's a relatively young Aes Sedai will watch her husband grow old and die of natural causes even while she still looks relatively young. So all of these things combined mean Aes Sedai very rarely ever marry. So that's the same pretty much there and it's it's basically this is a doomed romance she he can't give up the the vows that he has and and she can't change what she is they both love each other but they don't think it's going to work and it's cute and it's and it's sad and everything else then we have the girls they're both trying to listen to the wind and Nynaeve says she's not been able to listen to the wind since she channeled which is different from the books. She listens to wind all the time. She doesn't always understand what she's getting from the wind anymore because 
her ability has uh, changed a bit, but she's still able to listen to when the books. In this scene, however, Egwene is able to listen to the wind, and she hears the same thing that she heard on bell time, only this time it's much, much worse. She compares bell time being a whisper to this being a scream, which makes sense because there weren't actually that many Trollocs who attacked the Two Rivers. The Two Rivers was an unguarded set of villages with no real fighting men. Here in Faldara, they're in the borderlands. Every man, woman, and child knows their way around a weapon or is learning their way around a weapon. In order for them to be adequately menaced in this place, they would ha it would have to be a much larger quantity of, of Trollocs. And the next scene... And we'll see that a little bit later on. Uh, the next scene, they are headed down to see Ben again now that they know who she is. And they demand to find out what Min saw for Ren and Rain, and Min's like, no, that's that's not how this works. I don't give up what other people have seen. I will tell you that everything I see comes true. And that's straight out of the books. Min doesn't always know what she sees, but for people who pay attention to what it is she sees and keep going in the books, they will find points that the weird object that she saw floating around somebody makes sense as a prediction later on. And sometimes she does know what she's seeing, and whenever she does know what she's seeing, it absolutely comes true. She's never had anything that she saw not come true. And here we see her vision of Nynaeve burning from the inside out. And then here we see her seeing images of these sh soldiers all dying. And before Min can verbalize any of this, or before they can do anything to continue the conversation, a horn blows. Presumably a horn of alarm. And we switch scenes. Now we're seeing, we're back in the main hall, Lord Agelmar, trailed by many of his warriors and his sister, are coming into the into there. They're finding out about all of these Trollocs that are uh, amassing in Tarwin's Gap that are going to attack the fortress in Tarwin's Gap. And it's bad. It, it's it's real bad. They're putting a brave face on it. They're going to go take the men and they're going to go fortify Tar Tarwin's Gap and, and throw back the Trollocs as, as, as they've done many times. Did I say orcs earlier? I meant Trollocs. If I say orcs, ignore it. It's Trollocs. Orcs are D&D. &D. And here these two are talking about how this is bad. You can't hold the gap. And Lord Agomar tells her his fear. He fears this is the last battle. This is Tarman Gaiden. The, the prophesied last battle. Things are bad. Uh, there's no way they can hold the gap. But if there's a possibility to hold the gap, they need to do it. And if they can't hold the gap, they're going to leave the women of Faldara to try and hold Faldara. Basically, what they're trying to do is buy time. Every moment that they buy is a moment more for the messengers to get to the inlying cities and countries to let them know the Termagaiden is here. They need to protect themselves. If the world is to survive, they need to hold for as long as they possibly can. And that's pretty much the gist of this. All the men are going to go to Tarwin's Gap. All the women are going to hold Faldara. This does not look like it's going to go well. Uh, here we see the women setting up the siege engines. We've got ballistas, which are these big crossbows that are siege engines. And here we have Min. She is noping right out of this. I've seen where this is going. I know things are going to get bad. Bye! And I, uh, this is going to go slightly out of chronological order, but what ends up happening is Lord Agomar takes all of his men, they go to Tarwin's Gap, they fortify them, uh, they've got 
forests of crossbows, but the Midral and the or Trollocs are just, there's just too many of them. They start climbing over one another and eventually they end up basically overrunning the fortress in Tarwin's Gap and Lord Eglamar is killed as sort of a sign that they are going to take over this fortress. They are going to break through. They're done. And that is all I have in this folder. So, while the women are setting up, Lady Amelisa puts out the call for all women who can channel to join her. So we're going to follow Egwene and Nynaeve for a bit. Lady Amelisa, there's two other women. One of them has the Kusain on her forehead. That's this lady over here. I think she may be the same woman from the episode before. They are all out. They're out in the battlefield, outside. <laughs> There's nothing between them and probably the incoming horde of Trollocs and Fades that are going to come from Tarwin's Gap if it falls. So they're out in the middle of nowhere. Hopefully they know what they're doing. Amelisa makes a remark about uh, Nynaeve and Egwene being Moraines too and Nynaeve can't help but say we are our own people thank you uh, but basically these five women are their last hope as channelers then Amelisa asks to Link now this Link does not look like the one that we saw the Aes Sedai doing it's similar but it doesn't appear to be the same and it seems violent. Amelisa is clearly pulling a lot of power through the four other women. And she's pulling it and they're doing great things. They're blowing up lots of Trollocs. She's calling lightning. It's it, it's all good this, on that front. But it's literally burning these women from the inside out. She's pulling so much that she's burning out the women in her circle. The other two women fall and burn, and then you start screaming at Amelisa to let them go, that, that she's killing them. But Amelisa is so drunk on this power that she doesn't hear Nynaeve. She doesn't care Nynaeve. She can feel every grain. She, she is absolutely drunk on this power. She's bur she herself is burning from the inside out. And Egwene collapses and Nynaeve comes over and grabs onto Egwene and starts reciting the words that she used when she was initiating her into womanhood, talking about her braid and talking about how women is always alone and never alone. And we're to understand from this that she is somehow managing to absorb, to shield Egwene somehow from what's happened, what Emilisa is pulling from her. Emilisa burns herself out and Nynaeve falls dead. It's not entirely clear here that she's dead, but she definitely collapses. But when we see her, this is a little bit of time has passed at least. Nynaeve is clearly crispy and Egwene is trying to channel and bring her back and nothing's happening. And just as Egwene is about to give up, we can start to see these little wisps of channeling. And Egwene somehow raises Nynaeve from the dead. We don't know what, if any, consequences there are of this. Because we don't really see them after this. But yeah, they all, all the women die, except Egwene, who somehow manages to raise Nynaeve from the dead. Who knew that? We're going to get back to that later. While all that's happening, Perrin and Loyal are having a not great time. Uh, some of Lord Aglemar's men stayed behind, and they have removed the throne here from this dais or platform or whatever it's on and they're taking some pickaxes to the the stones and breaking them up. We don't initially know to what purpose but that's what they're doing. 
Loyal and Perrin are having a discussion. Perrin is clearly fighting with himself. He wants to help, but he doesn't want to do violence, and he doesn't know. He doesn't want to watch his friends die without him doing something, but he feels completely useless. And Loyal, being the voice of reason, says, If you don't know what to do, but want to help, you just need to ask. So they do, and they help them dig. Okay. And what they end up digging up, I don't have a picture of it separately, but is this this box here, which we find out is the box containing the Horn of Valer, or Valir, or how you want ever when you want to pronounce it. Now the Horn of Valir is kind of a plot device. It doesn't get blown in this episode. It may not get blown for a while, but uh, the Horn of Valir basically brings back all of your folklore heroes. So if we were talking about our folklore in our world, if someone were to blow the Horn of Valir in our world, people like King Arthur, Queen Boudica, um, uh, Robin Hood, like all of the heroes from our mythology will be brought back. Maybe some of the Troys like Hector Trojans like Hector and, and that sort of thing. Um, some of them are historical, some of them are ahistorical. Uh, historical and myth kind of flexes and, and sort of wanes and waves into one another. But basically all of the heroes from their legends and stories would come back and fight alongside them. So you can imagine that this is a big deal. This This could be a game changer for any big fight that you're in. So Obviously, the Horn of Valyria is a sought-after object. We talked about that a little bit in the last episode. In the books, no one knew where it was. But it's a show. you got to change some things and speed things up. So it's been buried under the seat at Faldara, apparently. And people knew it was there. Okay, so Padden Fane ends up using the right password to get people to open the gate to let him and his his fades in. It's clear they are not the people that were expected, but the fades just killed the people who let them in anyway, so that's always fun. Perrin, while they're op while they're trying to get the horn out, sees Fane and sort of goes and follows him. And tries to follow him, gets a little bit lost, hears screams, comes running back, and finds Padden Fane killing Loyal with the dagger that Matt had from Shatter Logoth, no less. So Loyal is dead a couple of ways over. Um, But since Perrin is not, at this point, capable of violence, he, he just can't bring himself to do it. He and Padden Fane have a, what passes for a conversation, and Padden Fane starts monologuing about, it's like, why do you think I went into the two rivers? Why do you think I dragged my butt up there to sell a few lanterns every year? It's because I knew you guys were Taviran. And by the laws of balance, some of you are going to come to my master's side. And while he's doing all of this monologuing and he's sitting in Agalmar's chair with the Horn of Valera in his lap, uh, we cut to a shot. Oh, come on. of these figures here, which were on the entrance to Tarvalin. We see Matt, and we see it's, this is a really dark shot, but here is the White Tower. 
So he's back in Tarvalon. Or Tarvalon. That, that's going to be really annoying for me, is the new pronunciations. No, oh, no, we did all that. So, as much as Perrin wants to kill him, Perrin can't bring himself to do that. And I think this is a good payoff of what they set up at the beginning with Perrin having killed his wife. Is it Perrin's... Perrin in the books always had this dichotomy between creator and destructor. So, the idea that he's so loath to bring out weapons that he would let had and Fane and the Fades go. Despite all that. It, it's a lot more justified than it would be compared to what his book motivation was. So I think that was probably why they did that. I, I'm still not 100% sure I like the fact that they basically fridged his wife. But this makes a little more cognitive sense than it would be if they left him with his book motivations. So... I'm kind of okay with that. Next up. So now we've done all the Fadara. Now we get to the meat of this, which is Random Moraine. And it's pretty much the two of them talking about what's going to happen. They're in the Blight. The Blight is rot. It's effectively a rotting jungle, which is something we don't really get a great sense of here. We don't really get a great sense of the extreme danger of the Blight either. But it's basically a rotting jungle that's super hot. It's super, super humid. Everything smells bad because everything's rotting. Anything you touch has a chance to hurt you. Uh, there are creatures who would kill you as soon as look at you in this thing. They do run across a young man whose body is covered in molds and stuff. And it's clear that he died horribly. But I don't think that really conveys what the blight is. The two of them talk back and forth. They they he sighs to rest, and we see Rand wake up from a dream. And Moraine starts to drill him on on what did you see? What was the dream? Dreams have power. And then all of a sudden, she dies horribly in front of him. Somebody sticks a blade through the back of her head that comes out her mouth, and she falls down. And this guy's behind her with the blade. And we've seen him from other other dreams, from other characters, and from Rand. So Rand shoots him with an arrow, and he lets the arrow go into his eye, and pushes it in, and it sort of takes all of this leathery stuff off his face, and now he looks like this. And he says he's the Dark One, and he he goes around, and he gives... He basically trash talks Rand. It's like, yeah, okay, I see that you are the Dragon Reborn. You don't look anything like the old guy, but I can see it in your eyes. What do you think you're doing here? Last time... What do you think you're doing here? Last time you came with 99 companions, all of them stronger than this one, and you think you're going to manage this this time with this one I said I? This doesn't make any sense. What are you doing? And Rand eventually stabs himself in the gut committing seppuku and wakes up from the dream where just like when he thought he was waking up from the dream before moraine starts to grill him in the dream and Rand's like i don't believe a word he said and continues on and then he starts instead of telling her about the dream he starts grilling her on what her plan is and her plan apparently is to give him a saangriel which is a very powerful magical artifact that will boost your ability to channel more of the power than you're used to the way they describe it working in this is not the way it's generally described to be working in the books. In this, he'll start to channel it, and then he channels it through this, and this magnifies it. Whereas in the books, you would embrace the source through this item, and because you're embracing it through the item, you're able to, to draw in more than you normally would be able to. So, I don't know why they decided to change that.
so yeah we're not sure why they decide to do that at some point in here they see Malkier and I don't have a shot for this but Rand makes some some crack about it. it looks like it's been part of the blight for a thousand years and and Maureen's like yeah no 40 at most and then she says something about how Malkier used to be miles and miles from th from Tarwin's Gap and now it's closer now so apparently the blight now has reality warping powers <laughs> if she'd said that the blight border used to be miles and miles from Tarwin's Gap or that the blight border used to be much further back away from Malkier than I got, would get that but the way she's saying it makes it seem like these two map points are now somehow closer to each other and I'm like what Anyway, they also at some point also see the army heading towards Tarwin's Gap and they decide that the best way that they can do to, f to help these people, to help people at Faldara who are going to be in line as these, who are going to be in danger from these Trolluxes is to continue with what they're doing. If they can seal the, the Dark One in, then they can deal with this. So they come to the Eye of the World, and this is not the Eye of the World. <laughs> This is a ocean nightmare of a shaft that is going down into the middle of the realm, but we'll we'll go with it. It it's okay, I guess. So they're going down they go down the stairs and they get to the bottom. Oh oh, I didn't get a shot of them at the bottom. So they get down to the bottom of, of this shaft and there is a circular bottom to it, and Rand starts seeing his former self, the last dragon, fighting the same person that he saw in his dream. He's not quite sure how, and he puts his hand on the ancient symbol of the Aes Sedai, the uh, yin-yang sort of symbol on the floor, and as soon as he touches it, he ends up in this delusion, where he's back in Emmons Field on a farm with Egwene and this little girl, who he finds out is his daughter, And everything seems cool. He's sort of mystified, not quite sure what happens. Like, did I hit my head? What's what's going on? I don't get this. And eventually he does try and test Egwene to see if this is his Egwene. To tell the, to repeat back what they didn't, uh, something they did in childhood. And she passes the test and they kiss. Meanwhile... Moraine's trying to wake Rand, who's fallen asleep, and the Dark One confronts her, so she channels. Trying to stop him. He stops all of the knives that she was sending after him, and turns around and stills her. Stilling, if you are not aware, is the female version of gentling. So she... He did what one group of Aes Sedai did to Loghain. She can no longer channel. And we'll come back to that. So she can no longer channel. And the Dark One's in this dream. All of a sudden he makes everything freeze. And he starts talking to Rand about how this is a paradise and he can keep it the way it is. And he shows him how the Dark One can change it. He asks, finally, how do I make this real? He says, because the Dark One's assistant, you can have this. this. This is what you want. You can have this. I can show you how to make it real. So, yes. And the Dark One effectively teaches Rand how to channel. Meanwhile, in the other world, Moraine has pulled a knife and put it to Rand's throat. And the Dark One is mocking her, going, he's channeling. And you don't know why he's channeling. He could be trying to free me. 
he could be trying to destroy me. You don't know why he's channeling. But the Dark One effectively teaches Rand how to channel. And Rand seems to be doing what he said he was going to do, and then he starts channeling into his hand where the Sangreal was. And he turns down the fantasy because the Egwene in here is not his Egwene. His Egwene would not want this for a future. His Egwene wanted to be a wisdom. His Egwene wanted to be a nice guy. His Egwene did not want to retire to a farm in the two rivers and have his babies, even though that's what he would want Egwene from Higwain. He loves the woman who has more ambition than that. And so he wakes up and he uses the Sangriel and he apparently destroys the Dark One, cracking the symbol under his feet. And after we cut away to go see other stuff that's going on, we come back and Rand has decided to strike out on his own. And Moraine can't stop him. He's like, what am I to tell the others? And she says, no, tell him, tell, tell them I died here. Tell them that I didn't make it back. And she's like, I can't lie. <laughs> it's like, you'll make it work. I know you will. Lan eventually finds her. She confesses that at the eye of the world, she confesses that she can't channel anymore. She can't unmask the bond because there is no bond anymore. She's no longer Aes Sedai. He's no longer a warder. She can't channel anymore. And she tells him that he's gone and talks about they talk about the piece of the seal that she's holding on to, which is Quendiar. It's a power wrought stone like substance that nothing, not even the power, should be able to break, and yet here we are with a piece of it broken. And then she echoes the line from Padden Fane that this was not the last battle. This is the first. This isn't the end. This is just the beginning. And roll credits. That's pretty much where we leave it. Pad and Fane now has Matt's dagger and the Horn of Valer. Egwene is alive. She raised Nynaeve from the dead. She's alive. Lan and Moraine are together. Rand has decided to just wander off on his own through the Blight. Like I said, they did not play up how dangerous the Blight actually is. This this would be suicide if we were talking about the books. Um, Matt is in Tarvalon. We don't know what's going to happen to him. And yeah. I I I don't find this terribly effective. We did see some people die. They weren't people we really cared about. It didn't really sell us on the existential dread that all of this was going to happen. Um, I don't like that Moraine was stilled. That did not happen in the books. I don't like that Rand just wandered off on his own in the blight. That he'd get killed. There, That's not a good look. Um... <laughs> I'm okay with Perrin letting Pad and Fane go. I think the... I don't think the Perrin of the books would have. But I think the Perrin that they created for this for the show would have. I think that's... That's natural. Um, I don't know what they're going to do about Moraine. She plays a pivotal role as a nice as the one Aes Sedai that Rand actually trusts for the next several books. So, um and now she's no longer Aes Sedai. I mean, that hasn't changed what's in her head. She's still a very knowledgeable woman. She knows a lot about what Rand's gonna have to do to cement his place as the Dragon Reborn. But 
Yeah, uh, I don't know what they were thinking. I... I'm disappointed. I, I think they missed several opportunities to create the kind of uh, dread that was going on in the books. Like, they tried to capture that in the last episode with, oh my god, there's so many Trollocs, we're all going to die. Ah! In, in the last episode there at Faldara with a bunch of people we don't care about. And I'm going to guarantee you that's the reason why they left most of the Emmons Fielders in Faldara. Because that means that that battle to save Faldara actually has value. But in the books, we've come to realize that even normal people know that there's something seriously wrong with the world. And are starting to wonder if this isn't the work of the Dark One or something. At Beltine, Beltine is supposed to be the start of spring. In the books, even though it is supposed to be the start of spring, they're not seeing any of the normal things that you would start to see at the start of spring. They're not seeing longer days. They're not seeing uh, the cold abating. They're not seeing any fresh growth of anything, really. Um, the ground's still frozen. They can't sow crops. Basically, winter seems to have its full grip on the world. And when they're in Emmons Field, that's... People are a little bit uneasy about it, but they've seen late springs before, so they're not too worried. Just because it's spring in the calendar doesn't necessarily mean that everything is fine. I'm sure in a few days we'll start to see normal signs of spring. But over the weeks and months that they're traveling, it starts to become more and more apparent that things are not okay. Winter's grasp is not letting go anywhere. It's not just the two rivers. It's all the lands that they go through. They're still not seeing any new growth. The ground's still frozen. Everything's still bad. Um, they're seeing more and more of what are normally called the Dark One's eyes. So more carrion creatures, more rats, more uh, ravens, more bats, uh, things of that nature. Um, weird stuff keeps happening. Like, I mean, the fact that there's a false dragon that was found that led to a war... There's unrest in different areas. There's a lot of indication that things are not normal. This is not okay. So by the time we get to... Um, by the time we get down to Faldara, and we find out that the Borderlanders have been dealing with unending sieges from hordes of Trollocs, even through the depth of the winter, which is unusual. Normally they, they let up some in the winter. So bad that they're having to keep their full garrison everywhere. That they've asked for help at Tarwin's Gap, which is the biggest uh, sortie point for the for the Trollocs and all of the hordes of the Shadow Spawn. That none of the other Borderlanders would that none of the other borderlands are willing to let any aid. And they're heading into the gap just like they are here, knowing they're not going to make it. They try everything to get Lan and Moraine to go with them, uh, an Aes Sedai being a great weapon against the Shadowspawn, and Lan being the uncrowned king of Malakir, he himself will be a rallying point for people. The other borderlands can't send anyone, but people will drop what the people will drop what they have and take up arms for for the golden crane if land chooses to fly it. But they're bound into the eye of the world. They know that they have other things they need to do. The eye of the world was not just a hole in the ground. 
The eye of the world was a paradise in the blight. They nearly died to get there. All of them, like they were under constant barrage, uh, they were under constant barrage of attacks. Lan had to be healed many times as he went out on sorties to kill things that were headed for the group. And they very nearly died getting into the Eye of the World. And the Eye of the World had been created by the women and men after the Dark One was put in his, in his cage to help the Dragon Reborn once Tarmengaiden came around again. It was not trying to put the Dark One back in his prison. It was getting what was needful from the Eye of the World. There was a battle at the Eye of the World. But that's not the reason why they needed to go there. And they've just broken the canon so much. I mean, they stilled Moraine. Moraine is the one in the books, is the one I sty that Bran trusts. They created this thing where now Egwene can raise the dead? In the books, this was not something that anybody could do. Nobody could repair a dead body and stuff their soul back into them. That is not how any of this worked. The only one who could do anything similar to that was the Dark One himself. And what he did instead of take the soul and repair the body and stuff the body, uh, stuff the soul back into it, was remove the soul from a living body and stuff the soul that he wanted into that living body. The pattern does does allow people to be reborn, but reborn, not just regenerated and put back in their body. That's not how this works. So we're fundamentally changing what is possible in this world. We're taking away one of Rand's major allies through the next several books, and we're changing how shit works. I'm not okay with this. I, I'm, I'm not okay with this. Now, am I going to watch season two when it comes out? And I don't know if we have a date for that yet. We probably don't. Um, yeah, I am. Because I want to see where this is going. There may be good reasons for, what the, for doing what they're doing. But to say I'm disappointed with how episode eight came up, I, I can kind of see what they were trying to do, but I think they did a shitty job. And I think that they have hamstrung themselves by changing things irrevocably from how they were in the books. Maybe they'll prove me wrong. But that's my verdict for now. Anyhow, if you've listened this far, thank you so much for joining me. Like this video if you enjoyed it, share it with your friends, subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, all of those things really help my channel, and if you're looking to help me even further, I do have a buy me a coffee link in the description below. No, no pressure, no, no requirements. It's just another way to help me out if you feel you would like to. Thank you again, and I'll see you in the next one. So, what did I think of the episode? Eh. I'm, I'm not terribly happy with it. I'm gonna be honest. Not terribly happy with this episode. I've liked the, se the series so far, but the way they left the characters at the end of this episode makes me wonder about what on earth they're planning for the upcoming ones, for the upcoming seasons. I mean, we started with Ren and Maureen going into the Blight by themselves. This not recommended. In the books, the Blight was a very serious threat. Even though you're just going through vegetation for the most part, the Blight was a threat. Even the plants could kill you. It was the rotting, horrible jungle with everything in there malevolent and evil and, and maligned and wanting to kill you. People went into the Blight 
frequently as an act of suicide. If so, yeah, not it's it's not just an easy thing that you can just waltz through the blight. And while there's some lip service paid to that in the fact that you saw the one dead body in there and there were some weird noises and they saw the the people around Tarm and Gaiden. It was a lot of tell don't show which is the opposite of what you want to do in a visual medium. Not real pleased with that idea. The fact that Rand just leaves the eye of the world and wanders off into the blight by himself and Moraine doesn't try to stop him. Mind you, Moraine by that point is stilled, which is another thing I have contention with. Moraine was never stilled in the books. She had her powers. This was not a thing that happened. And in fact, for the next several books, Moraine is one of the only Aes Sedai that Rand trusts. Has any level of trust in. So the fact that she's now stilled and can't be that for him is going to be a problem. And I don't know how they're going to solve that. Um, the things they've done to the eye of the world, the eye of the world was supposed to have, was supposed to have been created by those in the time of madness to leave a bunch of stuff for the dragon reborn to continue towards Tarman Gaiden. It was not supposed to be the boar where the dark one was. The, the, the idea of the eye of the world was they were going there to get the things they were going to need to fight the dark one if necessary. It was not supposed to be where the dark one was sealed away. That's Sheol Ghoul. That's a completely different place. And they've conflated the two in this episode. And I, I, I don't like it. I don't like it. Because we've now been to the Dark One's prison and fought there, and why would we then go back? And apparently it's really easy to get there because two people on foot made it there with no problems at all. So why haven't we done this a hundred times before? <laughs> yeah. No, I don't like it. The Egwene and Nanive thing, the fact that these five channelers who were not Aes Sedai are out on the Blasted Heath in front of Faldara with no cover against an incoming horde of Trollocs and Fades is utterly laughable. If they were full Aes Sedai and had taken the three oaths, they would have to be in danger if they were fighting men. Fighting Shadow Spawn? Even Aes Sedai could stand behind nice fortified walls and hurl fireballs. Shadow Spawn are exempt from this whole we can't use the power as a weapon. They can against Shadow Spawn. So why these women are leaving themselves completely exposed when none of them are very well trained and not behind some sort of fortification to keep between them and the incoming army who have arrows and can spears and can kill them is patently ridiculous. The fact that they decided to do this thing with Amelisa linking, we can argue that the linking version that she has figured out is not the same that is used by the Aes Sedai. The one from the Aes Sedai has buffers in it to keep what happened here from happening. You are not going to be drained. You're not going to have power enough pulled through you to, to burn you out in an Aes Sedai circle. Now, the idea that Amelisa has figured out a type of bond, a type of linking that is more dangerous, it's not the same as the Aes Sedai linking, uh, okay, we can hand wave that. We still don't know what it was Nynaeve did, and the fact that Egwene can now raise the dead is going to cause problems, because if she can raise Nynaeve, why can't she raise Amelisa and the other two ladies who are dead? Why can't she then go into 
Tarwin, Tarwin's Gap now that the Shadow Spawn are not gone and start raising all of these other dead. There was a very clear delineation with the power that they can heal. The most skilled healers can heal people right up to the brink of death, but once somebody is dead, they are dead. There's some, forgive the term, fuckery that the Dark One can do that kind of looks like resurrection, but not really. It's basically him taking souls of the dead people that he likes and and rev and shoving them into other people's bodies and displacing their souls. And yes, the wheel can weave out souls into a new life, but they do that by putting the souls from previous people into the bodies of babies and letting them be born again and have another life. You, it, at no point in any of the books did somebody take a dead body, heal it up so that it's no longer dead, and shove that person's soul back into it. This is not a thing that happened at any point in the books ever. This is, this is breaking the lore entirely. Don't mind bending it, but this is breaking the lore entirely. And I think this is going to go badly for this particular series. <clears throat> Nynaeve somehow managing to shield Egwene. Okay, I can hand wave that. But raising the dead? No. No, I'm not okay with that. Um, Perrin? I actually like what they ended up doing with him. Perrin... Given what... If Perrin's book character had done what Perrin had did here, I don't think I'd have liked it. The thing with Padden Fane actually happened at the beginning of book two. They pushed it into here, and I'm fine with that. That kind of thing happens with adaptations all the time. One second. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, Book Perrin would not have stood by and let Padden Fane take the Horn of Valir and Matt's dagger. Book Perrin would have gone after him uh, maybe. He would have hesitated, but only because Fane had a number of Midral. And Midral taking one on one on one is something to be proud of because a lot of people die trying that. He had more than one there. I don't remember exactly how many he had, but there was a few. So maybe he would have let that go. Um. But given Perrin's backstory now with him really struggling with the dichotomy that he did have in the books between somebody who creates versus somebody who destroys, I think that's kind of interesting. So I'm kind of okay with Perrin not taking up the axe until the end and still being reluctant to use it. That I think works for me. The idea that the Horn of Valir is just sitting around in Faldara, and apparently the Faldarans know where it is. Maybe the rest of the world doesn't, and Faldara's just been sitting on it because... Because that's that's one of the things that... That's one of the Heralds' the last battle is coming, is that the, the Horn of Valir will be found. In the books, they found it at the Eye of the World. The Eye of the World was this construct that was created to help the Dragon Reborn fight the last battle, and one of the things that was left there was the Horn of Valir. It was later stolen by, by Padden Fane and made off with. That happened early in book two, so uh, I, I don't know how I feel about that. If the rest of the world still didn't know where the Horn of Valir and, and Falmoran, Faldara was just sort of going, yeah, we don't know where it is either. Mind you, they've got it nicely secreted underneath the throne here. Okay then I can buy it. But if everybody knows it's in Faldara, I, I'm, I'm going to have a problem with that. That's, again, pretty lore-breaking. Um, it doesn't really matter that they got it from Faldara versus the Eye of the World if the rest of the world is still of the opinion that it's lost. Moraine being stilled. Not, I've, I've gone over that. that that's a bad... 
Um, Loyal's dead. Loyal has a lot more to do in the rest of the books, but now, no, Loyal's dead. We still don't know how Pad and Fame got through the ways, since apparently you need to channel to be able to open and close the ways. That, that's an issue. Um, and the fact that Moraine is no longer an Aes Sedai, and that makes Lan no more no longer a warder, pretty much kills the tension between Nynaeve and Land because Land because now they can get married if they want to, they can be together if they want to because. Moraine is no longer has any hold on land. So that kind of destroys that whole character arc. Um, and Matt's was kind of foobard right from the beginning, considering in the books, Moraine was able to insulate Matt somewhat against the, the damage that the dagger was doing to him, but she was not enough to have removed it from him. He actually ended up carrying it for a while. Padden Fane stole it from him when he stole the, uh, the Horn of Valir and made off with both. And that nearly killed Matt because he was linked to the dagger and the dagger wasn't his, his possession. They eventually did get it back, and, and uh, he was taken to Tarvel, and, and a bunch of Aes Sedai ended up healing him of it, but apparently that's no longer necessary, so we don't really know what's going on with Matt. They're painting him as somebody who may fall to the shadow. Not sure I like that. And Rand's wandering off on his own. If he was wandering off on his own anywhere but in the Blight, I don't think I'd have a problem with it, but they've made the blight pretty toothless, so whatever, I, I don't know. I'm going to watch season two. Perhaps there are very understandable reasons in season two why they decided to make these changes. Because if there's, if they're motivated changes, and they're doing it to explore something different with these characters, then I'll probably be okay with it. But I'm very much feeling like I did in season five or six, or maybe even season seven of Game of Thrones, where I'm watching this to see where it's going, but I'm not feeling very comfortable about how it's going. I'm watching it to see where it's going, hoping that they're going to pull it out and that there, those changes are going to be motivated, but not really com confident that that's going to be the case. So that's this one Wheel of Times fan's opinion on this. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the series on the season one. If you did, go ahead and leave a like. That really helps my channel. If you've not subscribed already, please go ahead and do that and hit the bell so that when we do have season two and I, if we do have season two, I'll be able to start covering some of the coverage on that. Um, I do have other ideas for upcoming content with regards to nerd culture, books that are being ad adapted that I'm uh, a fan of, and some other things like the MCU and that sort of thing that I want to cover. I'm planning a lot of different things for the channel, so it might be interesting to hit that bell just to see what craziness comes up on a regular basis up here. So subscribe, like, ring the bell if that's your jam. Um, if you would like to support me even further, I do also have a buy it, I mean a coffee link in the description if you feel that's something that you want to do. No pressure. Just simply being here and listening to me ramble is more than enough for me. But thank you for joining me, and I will see you in the next one. Keep it spooky, guys. Bye.